welcome to Lifestyle Gardening. I'm Kim Todd and we're so glad you could join us for another half hour of Good Gardening. On our program today, we'll show you how we're keeping our plants well watered at Raising Nebraska in Grand Island. We'll also hear about the importance of testing your soil and we'll tell you about a program from the university that emphasizes locally sourced food vendors. Where do plants spend the winter? They can't become snowbirds and head south for the winter, and they may not be able to survive outside in that branch chilling cold. So many suppliers pitch their tents. They bring the sensitive plants into different types of overwintering structures. Let's start today's program by looking at one of those suppliers. At the nursery here, we have several um, houses that we, we store most of our plants in. Three examples of that would be a house like this, uh, where it's a clear plastic house. Uh, we're able to keep a little bit more control and temperature with that, with venting and heating. We also use um, some outdoor Quonset houses, which would be basically a, a greenhouse with, with black, white plastic on it, or just white plastic on it. Uh, the benefits of that would be uh, with a black white plastic. Um, we can keep things cold and frozen for a long period of time. And we can store them without really having to look at them until say April. And then the third possibility would be with our, our white plastic houses and that gives us a little bit of flexibility um, as we're transitioning plant material from say like a greenhouse with clear plastic to the, the cold frame plastic uh, around the March, April timeframe when the, when the weather starts to moderate a little bit. Our plant material is largely in containers. And as, as the plants grow throughout the spring and summer, um, they're developing their root systems and their tops. And as the cold weather comes in, um, and as in Nebraska, with our upswings and downswings and, and uh, different types of precipitation that we get or don't get during the winter, uh, we have to protect those, the roots more than anything. We, we choose to use these covered houses where plant material is we can monitor the moisture, uh, we can monitor when we trim it, um, we can monitor how quickly it goes dormant, and um, we just have a little bit more control um, as opposed to just letting it sit outside and hope that Mother Nature doesn't uh, completely destroy it. So the overwintering process starts around October. The plants start shutting down as the light levels get less, temperatures start to fluctuate a little bit. And so we have to really start deciding, you know, what plants we have outside are going to spend um, in which type of uh, location, whether that be, uh, you know, greenhouse like this or, or the um, covered plastic that just gets no heat. We look at um, more or less the, the species of each plant and kind of over the years we've trialed and erred through it and looked to see which plants just can't handle that, the cold um, or the freeze thaw uh, that happens. Um, a lot of times in Nebraska. We've narrowed it down to items that basically we'll lose. Just they'll die almost 99% of the time if we don't bring them in and protect them. We do run into some challenges though. The moisture levels, um, if we overwater particularly, that can be a detriment to an overwintering plant because they're just not using uh, the moistures that they need, uh, that they are in the summertime. Um, also fertility levels as far as using fertilizers or not using fertilizers. Fertilizer can leave a salt buildup in the soil that can burn the roots over the course of the winter and so that, that has to be something that we constantly monitor. We also have so many different types of plant material whether it's uh, woodies or whether it's uh, perennials um, and we have to really decide when do those need to be cut back. Um, there's some plants such as echinacea, coneflower that is, is, a, is a challenging plant to begin with but everybody loves it and everybody loves the flower. And so we've learned over time that if we cut that plant back too early uh, in the course of the winter, it'll rot out. So we wait, you know, till as long as possible to cut that one back. Whereas opposed to um, items like uh, roses, um, spirea, that type of thing, we can, we can let the plant go dormant um, and, and cut it back kind of as we needed. Uh, a strategy we use for overwintering um, uh, perennials and grasses and, and roses and some shrubs. It's, it's called the burrito and um, basically in a sense it's, it's taking the plant material and protecting it with several different layers. We, we lay out a large piece of plastic for the outside uh, covering. With that we, we stack the plants 
um, you know, basically it can be one gallon, two gallon, three gallon containers, and we stack them in a way um, that they'll hold in place. And then we can bring winter blanket, and then we bring plastic, and then a, a layer of straw, and then another winter blanket, and then a layer of plastic, again, another layer of plastic over that. And the, the thing that we've learned about it is that it's kind of like what Mother Nature does when you leave, um, you know, leaf matter and material like that uh, in, in the garden over the winter. Um, we've kind of taken that and, and, and applied that in a, in a cold frame setting and it, and it insulates the plants. Even during a tough winter, the plants might only get down to 30 degrees underneath that burrito, even with an unheated house. So that's really been something that's, um, it takes a lot of labor to do is the only real drawback to it. And it's kind of a mess to clean up in the spring. But for the most part, the survivability, uh, we've been able to take plants that normally um, don't enjoy being in a greenhouse or just don't enjoy winter in, in general. And we can keep them in suspended animation and, uh, and they come up and they do great. We hope you enjoyed taking a look behind the scenes into what it takes to get the plants you're going to need for the upcoming gardening season through the winter. Now let's turn our attention to that soil. It's the key ingredient to gardening success and yet so many times we overlook its importance. A great way for you to know what is actually in your soil is to do a soil test. And that's the topic of this week's Go Gardening feature. Why someone would consider taking a soil test, or in this case, uh, a chemical properties test, is if they want to get some type of assessment of what is going on in their soil. This is really important if you're establishing a new garden. Um, if you have an old garden, things aren't quite working out the way you thought they would be, this is a great way to troubleshoot and find out more information about what's going on in your soil. So what and how you garden does determine where you'd want to take a sample. So if you had something like blueberry bushes, those are going to take different type of fertility and nutrient management than something like a tomato garden or uh, brassicas, that kind of thing. And so you would want to manage that type of soil differently. And one of those key things for management is knowing a soil pH. And you really have to take a soil sample in order to get that information so then you can use that information to change your soil so that it can better grow what it is you're trying to grow, say that blueberry or those tomatoes. You need a couple tools first if you're going to take a proper soil sample. More than likely, homeowners, this is not something you would have lying around. They cost several hundred dollars and that's a soil probe. Your local lawn and garden store might have them for you to borrow and use. Um, Farmer cooperatives certainly have these, local farmers would have them. But if you don't have access to something like a soil pro, you can get by with other tools like a common spade or even a bulb planter. So once you've got your tools and, and you're ready to take the sample, you want to then go to your areas that you're gonna manage uniquely. So if it's a vegetable garden, that's, that's your area that you'll be sampling. And so you're going to want to take multiple different samples from that area. You don't want to just trust one number. So take multiple what we call sub samples. You compile them into a bucket. You mix them up really, really well. And of that, you only take a small handful, maybe a pint or less. And you take that and you send that to a soil lab. So a critical thing along with taking your soil is the depth to which you sample. And the reason that's critical is there's a higher concentration of those nutrients located at the top. And a lot of recommendations from different extension programs, be that Nebraska Extension or some other universities that have extension programs, they calibrate their recommendations based on a certain depth. So after you've sent it to a reputable lab for soil testing, they're gonna give you a lot of different types of analysis and reports and that would be the pH, things like buffer pH, your nitrogen content, your organic matter, phosphorus, on and on and on. A lot of different nutrients that are essential for crop growth, or in this case, your vegetables or your flowers or what have you. The number one thing you're gonna wanna look at is that pH. And if it's too low or too high, there's things you can do and amend to your soil to remediate that situation like lime. 
As we showed you on previous episodes of Lifestyle Gardening, the addition of organic matter in the form of compost as you chunk up that gardening area each fall can do a world of good. And a soil test like this can help you understand what your soil needs to help you have a healthier garden each year. Okay, it's time now for our weekly landscape lesson. In the winter months in the plains, we like something outside that is green. Broadleaf evergreens or evergreys are a possible choice beyond traditional pine, spruce, and fir, depending on your location and your willingness to give those plants a little bit more tender, loving care. For this week's landscape lesson, I want to talk about broadleaf evergreens in the landscape. We don't have a lot of options in Nebraska. This is not really broadleaf evergreen country, but we can use them to add texture and interest to the, especially the winter landscape. So I brought with me a handful of the ones that we might see most commonly in the central east, northeast, and southeast. A couple of them are actually western plants. And when we say broadleaf evergreen, what we really mean is plants that have broad leaves and they're evergreen. Issues associated with that end up being desiccation in the winter or the drying out. So one of the things you have to consider with broadleaf evergreens is the, the location in the landscape. This is really important with all plants, but particularly if you think about during the winter months, these broad leaves, whether they are on holly or boxwood or mountain mahogany or some of our, our viburnums, they continue to transpire over the winter months and they are particularly susceptible to wind desiccations. So if they're in a location where you have pavement that reflects heat, the temperatures rise and drop rapidly, it's sunnier than, than it would be in the summer months if they were shaded with other plant material and that wind kicks in, that will really suck all the moisture out. And just as an example here, this is, this is one of our more common and sort of thug-like broadleaf evergreens, which is one of the Euonymuses, Euonymi, and you can see these leaves that were off the same plant, but they're the ones that were south, southeast fa uh, facing against the concrete. So really these are former leaves on this plant. Boxwood is one of the ones that has smaller foliage. It's quite useful in the landscape and, and pretty resilient. It doesn't really like high pH. The western alternative might be mountain mahogany or curl leaf mountain mahogany. It's a little bit of a different character. The holly is one that is pretty spectacular, full shade, um, part shade. This one isn't showing any desiccation whatsoever. Our native alternative to that would be mahonia. And then we do have a handful of viburnums that have broad leaves and they are evergreen. They tend to curl when, when they are not um, moist enough and when they are subjected to those drying winds. So you get the quality and the texture, but you don't have a plant that looks full. Make sure that you give these plants the right location in the landscape and they will be able to contribute to the winter. We love our lush green and colorful garden during the growing season, but your landscape doesn't have to be dull and dreary through the winter months. The great thing about these broadleaf evergreen plants is that they can put on a show in the spring, but they also provide interesting colors and textures when everything else is dull. We've documented the progress of our horticulture and agriculture installation at Raising Nebraska on the grounds of the State Fair in Grand Island. We want to show you what Nebraska is all about in plants, but keeping those plants well watered quickly became a challenge. We were fortunate enough this year to have a local company partner with us for a new un underground soaker system that will ease all the hard work it takes to water our flowers, vegetables, and ag crops. Right now, we'd like to show you how that system was installed this fall. So today out at Raising Nebraska, what we are doing is we are installing the subsurface drip irrigation. And what that is, is it takes that drip tape and it puts it 12 inches into the ground. And that's good for a lot of reasons. For one, we don't have to worry quite so much about picking that drip tape up every year, making sure we don't hit it with equipment or with a shovel or anything along those lines. And it also cuts down on the evaporation because the water is release below the soil surface and so it's directly in contact with those plant roots. 
So that's one of the benefits of subsurface drip irrigation. What's going on now is they're laying the tape down into the trenches, they're gonna cover it up, and then they're going to hook it up to the water line, and then we're gonna have it go through that way. Normally, subsurface drip isn't installed on a small setting like this, so that's one of the issues that they're having out at this site, is that small space having to deal with those tight corners and tight quarters, but they're making it do and they're making it work. Another benefit is we don't have to overhead irrigate with subsurface drip, so we don't have to worry about some of the diseases that come when the water splashes on the foliage of those plants. So SDI is subsurface drip irrigation, and what we're doing is we're burying a, a small polyethylene tubing down about a foot underground, um, and the whole idea is to put out small quantities of water to spoon feed the plants um, the water throughout the season. Subsurface drip irrigation allows us to put water on underneath the ground to make it more efficient. We simply eliminate the evaporation part of irrigation. Um, we're doing it in one area here on the grounds at the state fair, at the state fair but this uh, replication is very uh, representative of what we do in the state of Nebraska. So we do um, projects out in the panhandle of Nebraska which includes a lot of different crops that we would have here in the central part of Nebraska. So this is a really unique opportunity for us. But probably one of the, the biggest hindrances to drip irrigation right now is, is rodent damage of getting down and chewing on the line. So there's a lot of things that you can do to, to prevent that, but it really needs to be a preventative practice. This is just one of the improvements that we're doing out at the Raising Nebraska Outdoors site. In addition to the pivot and the overhead irrigation, now we can add the subsurface drip irrigation to show people the different methods that are used. That new system will certainly make watering a lot easier. We really encourage you to visit us during the fair this summer and learn about all of the wonderful things that Nebraska has to offer. Alrighty, now let's take a few minutes to answer those viewer emails. We really love to hear from you. Send us a picture to, to email byf at unl.edu. And our first question is actually an insect question. This one comes to us from kind of up around the Blair area. They sent us this gorgeous picture of this very interesting caterpillar, larva, use the right words if you wish, but this creepy crawly insect. And our great insect guy, Jonathan, identified this, he thinks, as either a bed straw hawk moth or a sphinx moth of some sort. So that would of course be the larval stage and they feed in August or September. They have a, a fairly narrow uh, host range of plants, but it, it includes fireweed, epilobium, which is not something that we typically see in the eastern part of the state. Also bed straw, which is one of the things we see in this part of the state. So uh, if I had that guy in my landscape, I would watch him closely sort of enjoy that interesting mix of colors and that strange um, defense mechanism of that orangish horn. And then I would see what he turns into and go from there. All right, we have a second question. This is from a viewer that is kind of down in the Falls City area. And they wanna know whether this is a good time to prune their flowering crab apples. So kind of a yes and no answer on that one. Uh, the yes answer is, of course, when your saw is sharp and you have the time, that's a good time to prune. The no answer is, we have an awful lot of woody plant material this year that is extremely brittle. And, and uh, that is potentially or possibly a result of the strange weather we've had with sudden uh, up and down sort of temperatures as well as lack of moisture and then freezing of those cells. The other issue with crab apples, of course, is depending on how much pruning you do and where, you're going to be pruning off the flowers. So if it is a little bit of minor cleanup pruning, if it's a bit of doing some of those epicormic sprouts or water sprouts, if you did not get to suckers from the rootstock, if it happens to be one of those, yes, I always tend to be pretty conservative with the crab apples do minor pruning in the spring, and then actually do a lot more pruning if necessary in the summer. And it is one of those species that you really have to keep after. Our third question is from out in the Sutton area. This is a uh, viewers who planted new clump service berries just this fall, 
mulched them well, and just in the last two or three weeks, they're seeing this almost shredded sort of appearance on some of those new tender trunks. And this is at that primary perfect spot on the trunk of the tree, where my guess is that our great uh, critter creature, Dennis, is going to say that would be chipping from those squirrels as they are uh, getting ready to do their nesting thing and their territorial thing right now. So of course, then the, the, our viewer wanted to know, is it too late to do anything about it? The answer is absolutely not. Go ahead and cage those uh, or protect them with, with the right kind of wrap, but, but do it for everything in the vicinity because you can kind of see from this picture that they started one day and then came back and took another little chip or another little bite the next day. That will continue to happen. This is also prime season for rabbits to be doing a lot of damage, but theirs is not that kind of damage. For 65 years, Backyard Farmer has helped Nebraska gardeners grow their own food. And that was even before it was cool to do. This idea has blossomed into a national interest in local food sourcing, and a group right here at the University of Nebraska is encouraging grocery shoppers to look local first. For our final feature today, the Buy Local, Buy Fresh organization is helping shoppers connect with local suppliers. I'm really happy to be talking to Lauren today from Buy Fresh, Buy Local about that particular concept and organization and how it is trending in Nebraska, if it is trending at all. Mm -hmm. So Lauren, have at it. Great, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I coordinate by Fresh by Local Nebraska, which is a membership organization that focuses on uh, promoting the production and consumption of local food. And this is a really exciting time for local food. I think that we've seen um, big movements on the coasts and we're seeing a lot more of it um, in, in the middle of the country. Um, though I think it's, there's a rich tradition of eating locally, um, we're seeing that, that movement kind of being revived, um, especially within the last five years. And I think a clear indication of um, local food movements trending is that there are a lot more studies being done about local food. Um, for instance, last year the USDA just came out with a local food um, survey and study that, that also kind of highlighted what was going on in Nebraska. So you can look, look for specific details on what's happening in Nebraska in those, that type of study. Um, but we're also seeing lots of uh, movement toward farm to school and um, thinking a little bit more creatively about um, markets, different marketplaces for, for local food. Um, so I think it's, it's local food kind of, uh, the trends are very regional and it's hard to make a kind of a blanket statement about local food across the country, but uh, we definitely are seeing it trending um, here in Nebraska. And, and that's, it's inclusive of um, older people and young, younger people. I think when you look at different demo demographics, uh, for instance, younger people, you could start to see some of the barriers that exist for beginning farmers when it comes to land access and capital and that kind of thing. We're also seeing a lot of people come back to family land um, and, and in some cases convert that into um, uh, an operation that focuses on um, food for local markets. So it's, it's an exciting time. Perfect. And so what does this actually mean for consumers and where do they, where do they find the label? What does that really mm -hmm. mean? So Buy Fresh, Buy Local is not the only local food label. Um, in fact, if you go to a grocery stores, big grocery store chains, they might have their own label. But um, Buy Fresh, Buy Local is a, a national label. So that means that if you go to another state that has, um, has a Buy Fresh, Buy Local network, um, you, can, you can see that label and understand something about that product. Um, and there's no, the, the definition kind of ranges a little bit, but for us, um, by Fresh by Local means that it's a Nebraska product, product or it's a product coming from a, um, a county in a surrounding, in a, uh, in a state um, surrounding Nebraska um, that, that, borders, that borders the state. So um, perhaps, like for instance, there are members in Iowa that um, go to Omaha as their local market, and so they might be included in Buy Fresh by Local Nebraska um, because it words, is a local product. It's not my carrots coming from California. Right, Perfect. exactly. And so you can have, um, I think that, that it communicates a sense of um, something that you can trust in. Um, and I think that that's a big issue when it comes to local food because there's no certification. Um, every consumer has to do their own homework, and so this is a label that um, communicates something important to a consumer. Perfect. So we're also seeing winter markets and a lot of farmers markets. How does this tie into that? It ties in very closely. So um, 
Buy Fresh Buy Local um, works with farmers and ranchers and businesses um, like grocery stores and restaurants, but it also works with farmers markets, um, hopefully more and more across the state. Um, but mostly we work with um, farmers markets in the eastern part of the state. Um, that uh, not all of their members are by Fresh by Local members, but they are um, also trying to communicate something about their market, that they put a priority on um, locally produced food. And so in many cases you can, uh, you can, ver you can trust that the, the farmer that you're buying from is the farmer who um, produced the food that you're, that you're purchasing. Okay, and mm -hmm. so we, we do end up at farmer's markets with things that are probably still on the stand, local things. Do they go into the juicer? Do they go to the mm -hmm. food bank? That's really kind of the wrap-up question. What happens to the stuff left over? Yeah, I think that there's a, there are a lot of people being very creative with um, markets, especially small family farms, um, because they're trying to build a, a viable business. And so uh, they're looking for lots of different markets. And so in many cases, um, the things that are left over after after market um, will go into value-added products that they that mark that farmers will sell later in the season. For instance, in the winter, um, things that can be you know have a shelf life. Um, they uh, some produce goes to local food banks, and there are there are organizations that do um, offer gleaning, and you know they connect they connect farmers with with food banks and people who need who need food, um, especially you know healthy healthy produce. Um, I think that there's also there are also uh, there's a a lot of movement toward figuring out new markets for for products as well. So um, products uh, uh, markets, excuse me, um, where uh, a producer can get uh, still get a premium for that product even though they didn't sell it at market that day. And so they work directly with um, restaurants, for instance, to be able to um, have another market for that product um, and and also get it to uh, a customer that wants to buy it. Perfect. So we've been talking to Lauren from Buy Fresh, Buy Local about the kinds of things that you might look for either in your winter farmers markets or in regional farmers markets or at the grocery store. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you. Local resources are expanding every day, including local farmers markets and vendors just like we heard about. And many of them offer fresh, organic and naturally grown produce. So if you can't grow it yourself, be sure to check out Buy Fresh, Buy Local. And that's our program for this week. Next time we'll be featuring what media to put in your containers and the benefits of a raised garden. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So good afternoon, good gardening. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time on Lifestyle Gardening.